Good morning, everybody. It is the Drive to School podcast. If you are not old enough to drive to school, it is the Ride to School podcast. You can still listen. It's allowed. I'm Pastor Goodman. I'm the content executive of Higher Things. And joining me today again is Reverend Dr. Matthew Richard, uh, digging himself out from mountains of snow up in North Dakota. How you doing? Hey, good, Harrison. We had uh, back-to-back uh, snow weekends. And then the first weekend was man, two weeks ago, Easter Easter week, we had uh, 36 inches, I think 36 to 40 inches of snow. And then we finally started to melt. And then we got hit with a huge, huge uh, slush and ice storm this last Sunday. And uh, so we're all tired of snow. That's a <laughs> we're really kind of, we got back to back snow. Like when, when we say we got back to back snow, it, it was kind of pretty outside. Your snow was literally tall enough to ride on the roller coasters at Six Flags. And that's, that's a different kind of thing. Yeah. You know, we had, uh, I know we're digging tunnels in the backyard. I mean, we had absolutely no snow and then we're digging tunnels in the backyard. I know, um, I, I kid you not my, my, my kids school, I dropped them off at school and my daughter, she's seven. She's like, look, daddy. She goes, we can climb on the school's roof. And sure enough, there's a drift that went all the way up to the, the roof of the uh, school and kids were sitting on, on the actual roof of the uh, school with dangling their feet on a snowbank and then going down the whole snowbank. I mean, so we're talking, gosh, 13, 14 foot drifts. I mean, uh, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not, I'm not, it's not like, you know, I caught a fish this big and it was actually, no, no, it was literally 12, 12 to 13 foot drifts and in some spots, uh, you know, in, in our, our town here. So, yeah. So the kids walked onto the roof and that's how tall the snow was. So I can't top that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That's impressive. I I don't, it's, it's almost May. Um, I, yeah, I'm speechless at that. So we're just going to pivot because I have no good segue. Uh, <laughs> Pastor, we've been we've been tackling the topic. What does Jesus have to say about? And then we're just sort of filling in the blank with stuff that people talk about a lot. And I know Jesus talks about too. So maybe we should start with his words instead of our own. What are we talking about today? You know, I've been, been wrestling with, with a couple of the guys. We're getting ready for a upcoming church service and we study the text. A group of us study the text. And I thought, hey, you know, let's talk about what does Jesus say about pastors? You know, and that's tough. It's tough to talk about because, you know, we got the caller on, right? And and so it'd be easy for us to say, you know, well, this is what Jesus says about pastors and then paint us in a nice, you know, positive light and and those losers over there, you know, and 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 we can't do that. But nonetheless, you know, Jesus has words about pastors. And this has been something that the church has wrestled with throughout history, too. Like, where do you see this sinner who speaks for God? Is he better than the rest of the, the congregation? Is he not? Is, is there something special happening? Or is he just sort of any old Joe talking about Jesus? What, what is going on? So maybe we really ought to see what Jesus has to say about it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think a good place to start, you know, is, is, is when Jesus says, uh, you know, well, let's, let's pull this back. I mean, it, 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 you look at the word pastor itself, you know, I'm not a big, big Latin guy, but my understand, my understanding the word uh, pastor in Latin is, is equivalent to shepherd, you know, it means shepherd. And so uh, what does Jesus say about shepherds? Well, uh, in, in John 10, he says, what I, I am, I am the good shepherd. So right away, right out of the gates, uh, Jesus says, Hey, guess what? Um, I'm the shepherd. And then he also says this, I'm, I'm the good one. I'm the good shepherd. And, and maybe we could say, okay, well, okay. We understand a shepherd. A shepherd takes care of what sheep, uh, you can't be a shepherd without sheep. You have to have sheep, but what makes uh, a shepherd good? And he says, very, very frankly, I lay down my life for the sheep. And then he goes on to say, you know, well, there's hired hands. And what are the hired hands doing? Well, they run, they run and any sign of threat, a uh, sign of the wolf coming to devour and to eat the sheep, the hired hand runs. And so the good shepherd, he, what he doesn't run. He, he lays his life down. And so, I mean, there's a real easy contrast there. And, you know, and I'd like to think about, you know, all the times of, you know, I'm going to hold steadfast for my flock and be a good shepherd, you know, like Jesus. But more often than not, I find as I consider myself, uh, how many times I am the hired hand and how many times I fail. And uh, nonetheless, Jesus still works through a simple Matt Richard uh, to proclaim his goodness. And so I think we could say what makes a good shepherd, uh, under shepherd or a good pastor is that, um, he admits when he's a hired hand, when he fails and that's often. And then he also points to the one that will never run the one, the one that will never run away. The one who ultimately gives his life before the, uh, sheep before the wolf, the wolf of death, the wolf of sin, whatever that wolf is, uh, that he gives his life for his sheep. That's, and that's a huge, huge thing uh, to say, I am not Jesus. 
um, it, it's it's uh, kind of a rite of passage if you're a pastor that sooner or later a little kid is going to call you Jesus and everybody's going to get really uncomfortable. Uh, it, it's happened to me a couple of times where, where I wear my robes and I guess I got a beard. Uh, so, you know, it's, 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 you know, not so, so far off. Uh, but also, um, it, it's, it's something that in a sense, I want to recoil from because I know all the ways that I am so, so far short of that standard. Yeah. You know, it was just, it was just a couple of months ago, a kid came up and gave me a hug and, and said, Jesus. And, uh, and, and, and so two things happen. Uh, number one, I, I was, the hug I got was amazing to get a hug from, from a, a child in the church. And then, but then the, the, the fact that, that the child called me Jesus in that office was very humbling. The very fact that they would connect the pastor, the office of pastor to Christ and his gifts. Okay. So that was really cool. I mean, that was good that they made the connection, but then to, to, to consider that, man, they see me as Jesus. Then at the same time, I, I shuddered because I'm like, I'm not Jesus. Uh, you pull back this white alb, which represents uh, our baptism that were washed clean. You pull it back and you have what you have, you have this dark, dark shirt, which, which shows our sin. Now, I, I don't know if this is, this is a hundred percent true on this, but this is at least the way I understand it. And at least I, the way at least I think about it, you know, I wear this black shirt, which, which I see as, as showing my depravity, my original sin, that I'm a sinner through and through, just like you, Harrison, that we are sinners in thought, word, and deed. And, and when we confess our sins at St. Paul's, I stand right on the floor with my flock at the very front as chief of sinners. And I say, I'm a poor, miserable sinner. And I start us off and we say it together. And then this little white tab here, right? Um, you know, it's, it's plastic. People are wondering what it is. It's plastic. And then when you pastors forget it, you, you can use what white, uh, paper business <laughs> yeah. business card. Right. But you know, the, the unique thing is this is over top my vocal cords right here. And, um, the heaviest thing that I, that I carry is this piece of plastic. And so when I'm like this, I know, if, you know, when I'm done with the day, I go like this and I'm off duty and I just, just to, eat, eat right. Again. But in the morning when I go like this and I button my button like this, and I put this on, uh, this is heavy. It's very heavy. And I put it on like this. And then that is whiteness. And it's over my vocal cords that I speak the words of Christ. They're not my words. I don't have the authority to just throw my opinion around and say what I want or what I think. I have to choose my words very carefully that I'm speaking the words of Jesus and that my words are conveying what Christ says and then pointing to Christ. And I think that's the essence of being a pastor is that we acknowledge number one, that we're that sinner, that we're not Jesus but that we have been given the words that we're stewards, that we're uh, um, 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 gift bearers of the words of Christ. And that's over top of our call of our vocal cords. Right. It's, it's the biggest tension to say, I am not Jesus, but when I open my mouth from the pulpit, he's talking. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. That's and so, words are. and so we, you know, we think about Ezekiel too, you know, the Ezekiel talks about, you know, good shepherds and bad shepherds. And uh, you look at the, the hired hand, the hired hand, he runs, the hired hand, he takes, the hired hand abuses the sheep, he takes from the sheep. Whereas you see a good shepherd and, and, and uh, pastors who are, are walking in the stead and by the command of Jesus, those shepherds, they're always giving God's gifts. And even, even I mean, even if, if a shepherd comes along and, 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 and preaches the law uh, to, to show and reveal sin, that is done not to somehow abuse the sheep. It's to reveal sin that is what ensnared them. And, and that sin is to be brought to light for the sake of repentance. And repentance is a gift itself too, to acknowledge sin, to understand our sin, then is to understand our need for Jesus. And so even when the pastor is ministering uh, law, preaching the law to, to show the sheep their sin, to show them their, their wounds, it's for the sake of driving them to the good shepherd, Jesus, for um, the healing balm of forgiveness of sins. All right. So I've got two questions. I've got an easy one and, and follow up that, that's maybe a little bit harder. Um, so if, if you're a kid in high school, what can you expect from your pastor? What can you expect from your pastor? Yeah. Well, if you're in high school, I think, I think a couple of things. Number one, I would say that, that, you know, that your pastor is someone safe that you can talk to. And we talk about the seal, the confessional seal. That means that you can go to the pastor, that there's the one person in the world you can go to and talk to the pastor and he's not going to what share with the uh, gossip train, you know, uh, you know, in, in school, you, you, you can talk to all these other people. And then next thing you know, it gets spread throughout the whole school. And, and, and with a pastor, 
the buck stops with the pastor. There's, there's, there's a, there's a dead end that when you confess your sins to the pastor, that he takes it to the grave, um, not even to the grave, but we take it to before Christ. And that when Christ proclaims forgiveness, that sin is truly forgiven. So then therefore we, we can't talk about it. It's, it's done. It's accomplished. So I think there's a seal that, that when you expect from your pastor, that you'd be able to go there with confidence um, that he's not going to blab it up to everyone around. And then what can you expect from the pastor? Uh, expect to hear uh, wisdom that comes from your pastor based upon the word of God, you know, not the opinions of the pastor, but discernment to discern how to make it uh, through this life and to understand life. But probably most importantly out of all of that is going to be those healing words of Jesus, the, the forgiveness of sins pronounced um, the, the, the conscience we we've talked about the conscience before the guilty conscience to be, uh, uh, cleansed the guilty conscience to be clean, uh, to be able to sleep with both eyes shut at night. And that only comes as the pastor delivers the gifts of the forgiveness of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the words of Jesus, uh, and his gifts, uh, to the youth. That's huge. Um, and I think it might help answer the next question. Um, what do you do if you're having trouble trusting your pastor, either because you found out that he's a sinner or because he he's too old or because he he's messed something up? What do you do if you're, you're having trouble trusting your pastor? Yeah, I think, I think number one, um, you know, understanding that the pastor, again, the black shirt, the pastor is a sinner through and through. And um, I have told people at uh, St. Paul's here and, and in every church I've been a part of, you know, that um, I am not perfect by any means, and the pastors are not. Uh, we we sin in thought, word, and deed, and so if a pastor sins um, and fails, uh, it, chances are he, you know, I would say a big chance of time he's maybe not even aware of it. And so go talk to him. Um, I've had people come in, and you could just tell with the the humility they they don't want to share, but they say, you know, pastor, you really let me down. And 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 the majority of pastors, when they hear that, it's going to make their heart sink. And they can be, oh, you know, Lord have mercy. And then that gives an opportunity for the pastor to what? Confess sin and to apologize to his parishioners. And then as the pastor apologizes to the parishioners or apologizes to a youth or whoever it is, then the parishioner is able to what? Pronounce the gospel to the pastor's ears. And pastors need to hear the forgiveness of sins too. And then once that forgiveness of sins is pronounced to the pastor and the pastor hears it, then there's something just, just absolutely profound that, that when we confess sins to one another and we pronounce the name of Jesus upon each other and we forgive each other in Jesus name, that actually forms a bond, a bond of trust. Um, there, there's a sense where that bond of trust grows and, and, and there's that, that, that connection. Cause you've gone to the basement together, if you will. And so I would say that talking to your pastor is, is, is huge. Not only talking to your pastor, but praying for your pastor too. Uh, praying that the, uh, when the devil attacks, where does he attack? He typically attacks the office of ministry. And so praying for your pastor as well. But I would say talking more than anything else, uh, visiting and building that, 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 uh, that bond through uh, being in the uh, trenches together, uh, knowing that your pastor is a sinner and thought word indeed, and that your pastor needs to be what delivered forgiveness as well. That's perfect. That, that says a lot about a pastor. Um, thanks for, for showing us Jesus here, pastor. Hey, it's, it's great. We, we all, right. We we're all underneath the, the good shepherd and, um, the good shepherd, he, what he lays his life down for, for all of us. And that's what does it's under shepherds. We, we simply confess what he has done and point to him. And, uh, and it, it is, it's truly a miracle that he uses poor, miserable sinners such as us, uh, to deliver his grace and his forgiveness, uh, to proclaim that, um, we're not worthy, uh, but he is. Amen. Pastor, thanks so much for joining us today in the drive to school. Hey, good to see you, Harrison. Have a good one.